Hello and welcome to the AutoX Show. Now sit back and relax because we've got a packed show for you today. Now Mahindra resurrects the Java brand in India and Arup heads to Udaipur to check out their brand new bikes. In the second part of our AutoX Best of 2018 panel discussion, I sit down with a pair of senior leaders from TVS and Mercedes-Benz. Abhishek heads to Gujarat to check out a brand new SUV from Nissan, the Kicks. And I head to the UAE to check out Audi's first production EV, the e-tron. So I come to you in the middle of a sandstorm in the UAE desert because of this. This is the brand new Audi e-tron. And Audi is gonna hope that this sandstorm is headed directly in the direction of Tesla. So far, Tesla has been the poster child for electric mobility. Well, frankly, Tesla has put electric mobility on the map and it has made electric mobility sexy. Now in the post Dieselgate era, the VW Group has focused all its resources on electric mobility, and this is Exhibit A. This is Audi's first electric car. That's why we're in the desert outside Abu Dhabi, because we're gonna get into the driver's seat and see if Tesla should be having sleepless nights. So the traditional automakers aim to hit Tesla hard with a series of production electric vehicles. We drove the Jaguar I-Pace a couple of months ago, and it was fantastic. Behind me is the Audi e-tron, and I happen to think it looks really good. Sure, it doesn't have Falcon doors like the Tesla Model X, but look at it, it looks really, really good, and it's got virtual wing mirrors. We've seen them on concept cars for a number of years, but this is the first production car to have, instead of a traditional set of wing mirrors, virtual wing mirrors, cameras with screens on the inside. Absolutely everything in this car is designed to cut through the air as efficiently as possible. It has a coefficient of drag of 0.28 with a standard set of wing mirrors and a CD of 0.27 with the virtual wing mirrors that you see here. Incidentally, it betters the Jaguar, which is 0.29, but both are outdone by the Model X, which is ultra slippery at 0.24. But there's one distinct difference between the Tesla, the Jaguar, and the Audi that we have here. You see, the Audi e-tron is actually coming to India. It'll be introduced a year from now, at the end of 2019 or early 2020. And of course, it won't be cheap. It's expected to set you back well over a crore when it hits Audi's Indian showrooms. Right, we are at Jebel Hafid a beautiful mountain road in the UAE, and this is the perfect place to test the dynamics of this car. Now, obviously we drove on the highway getting here, and the first thing that strikes you about driving this car on the highway is that it is extremely, extremely, extremely easy to drive. It feels very natural, and actually the first thing that strikes you is that it feels really, really quick on its feet. Because there's no engine noise, there's hardly any sound at all, you've got acoustic glass, you've got very little road noise, uh, virtually non-existent, very little wing noise um, and also that helps because the, the wing mirrors are so little since you've got these virtual uh, wing mirrors, uh, cameras rather than full-size wing mirrors, there's very little wind noise as well. So uh, it's really very silent, very refined and you hit the accelerator pedal and the car takes off. So you've got a 95 kilowatt hour battery pack which is good for 400 kilometers of range according to Audi. You've got a uh, two motors, one in the front and one at the back, a combined power output of 300 kilowatts and 664 Nm. Zero to 100 in boost mode of 5.7 seconds. So it's pretty, pretty quick. Boost mode is a little bit extra sort of surge and power that it gives you for uh, eight seconds to really get things going. Now, as we drive down this mountain, we should actually, if we're coasting and uh, being a little bit gentle with the accelerator pedal between the brakes and the fact that we're coasting going downhill, we should actually be generating range um, and increasing range as we're going downhill.
Now, uh, the one thing that it does not have, which a lot of EVs do and which you get used to pretty easily, is single pedal drive. So a lot of the other EVs, like the BMW i3, uh, like the Nissan Leaf, like the Teslas, have um, what they call single pedal drive effectively. So the minute you get off the accelerator pedal, it's very, very aggressive deceleration. So it's almost like as soon as you get off the pedal, you're using the brakes to slow the car down. Uh, this one does not have it. You've got paddles here, which allows you to adjust the amount of deceleration that you have. So uh, at any given point in time, you can use the paddles to make the deceleration more aggressive, uh, but it doesn't give you that by default. I'm not sure how I feel about that at this point, because when you're in an electric car, uh, essentially, you get very used to the car doing everything for you. So you want all the autonomous driving technology, you want that single pedal drive, you want it to be as effortless, even mindless to a certain extent as possible. And this is not quite there yet. It does not have uh, the levels of autonomy that a Tesla would have, for instance. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't have the single pedal drive. So how does it feel when you're pushing it around these corners? Well, it weighs two and a half tons, so it is a heavy, heavy machine. The advantage that a lot of these electric cars have is that the battery pack is set very low in the floor of the car. Um, and as a result of that, the weight distribution is very good. The weight distribution is 50-50 front to rear. The way the power is distributed is that the majority of the power goes to the rear wheels. Um, but when you ask for it, it transfers, well, it doesn't transfer power to the front, but the, uh, the motor in the front starts uh, feeding power to the front wheels as well. So effectively, it acts like an electronic all-wheel drive system. So the battery pack alone weighs 700 kilos. So it's certainly a heavy car. So when you're pushing it in these tight, twisty mountain roads, you can sense that it is a big, heavy car. But for the most part, when you're driving it fairly reasonably um, and not going crazy around the bends, it does feel really quick on its feet. It does not feel like it weighs 2,500 kilos. Um, and it feels like quite a pleasant experience behind the driver's seat. So it's a bit of a mixed bag when you're in the driver's seat. The first thing is that you just get in and drive. You don't have to adjust to anything. It feels perfectly normal and perfectly natural to be sitting in the driver's seat of this car. Pretty much the only thing that you have to adjust to is the fact that you're not looking at the wing mirrors on the outside, but you're looking at screens on the door panels. But other than that, and that essentially takes uh, about five minutes of getting used to it, uh, and then you're done. Other than that, it feels like a very normal, natural driving experience. And that's a good thing because uh, it'll be very easy to adopt the EV driving experience. It's a little bit disappointing because it's such a massive jump in technology and it's a paradigm shift as far as the automobile industry is concerned. But from the driver's seat, you wouldn't know it because it feels pretty much like any other well-engineered, reasonably fast, quiet luxury car. In terms of it being involving and fun to drive, well, it's never going to be as involving or fun to drive as a car with a big V8 or even a V6 under the bonnet. It just doesn't feel visceral. It does feel a little bit more disconnected. You get in it and you want the technology to pretty much take over and do everything for you because you're not an integral part of the driving experience. You feel like you're an additional component in uh, this quest for zero emissions motoring in the most efficient, quiet and luxurious way possible. If that's what you're after, then the Audi e-tron scores five stars because it does that very, very easily and extremely, extremely efficient. Coming up next on the Auto X Show, we check out Java's brand new motorcycles. Now don't go anywhere, because there's lots more coming up after the break. Now, the Java brand is resurrected in the Indian market and Arup heads to Udaipur to check out the brand new bikes. Today we are riding both the Java and the Java 42 at Udaipur. After a gap of two decades, Classic Legends, a subsidiary of Mahindra and Mahindra, have got the rights to launch the new bikes. These bikes are manufactured at Mahindra's manufacturing plant at Pitampur in Madhya Pradesh. Now the new Java portfolio consists of three bikes, the Java, the 42 and 
the Pirak. Currently, only the Java and the 42 are available, while the Pirak will be launched sometime next year. Coming back to the Java, we will first write the Java 42 and later on the Java, and we will find out how both these bikes fare in real-world conditions. Java Motorcycles, a Czech brand, was established in 1929, attained a cult status in India and remained popular till it shut down in early 70s. The legendary brand was then rebranded as Yesdi before it called it a day in mid-90s. After riding these bikes for over 200 kilometers, the major difference between the Java and the 42 is that the Java comes with a classic chrome finish, while the 42 comes with a matte finish paint. Now the 42 also comes with a flatter handlebar which makes the riding stance a bit more aggressive. Now both the bikes are powered by the same 293cc liquid cool engine which churns out 27bhp and 28nm of torque. Now as both are retro bikes, we would have preferred if it offered a lot more grunt at low torque. Now if you enjoy cruising at low speed, then you will be forced to change gears as you can feel the engine knocking on a regular basis, which can be a bit annoying. But on the other hand, the bikes do feel street savvy as they respond very quickly when you open the throttle and it is very happy at mid-range power band. When it comes to the top end, the performance starts to flatten, especially when you cross the three-figure mark. We also notice that once you cross the 100 km per hour mark, the foot pegs and the handlebars start to vibrate. Now, it may not be as annoying and pronounced, but it does play in the back of your mind. Now both the bikes are mated with the same 6-speed transmission, but in case of the 42, we did feel a lot more false neutrals. Now coming to the suspension setup, we loved the Java's soft suspension setup, which is very practical for our Indian roads. It carpeted the potholes easily. When it comes to making a statement, the Java certainly leads the way. I love the dome-like shape of the headlamp. It brings back the retro flavor with a touch of class. The headlamp is not just about looks, as it provides an impressive wide distribution of light, giving the rider a clear view of the tarmac. Both the bikes come with a speedometer and a fuel gauge, which are analog, along with a digital odometer. Both the Javas are a breeze to ride, but when it comes to comfort, the seats are too flat and hard, which is a pity as they can be quite uncomfortable on long rides. Now keeping in mind that both the vehicles are pre-production models, Java still has some rough edges to iron. Now the engine could be a lot more refined and as mentioned before, a lot more grunt is needed for low end torque. But what is impressive is its fit and finish which is consistent and it's built solidly. What was even more impressive was its handling characteristics as it remained stable at mid corners thanks to the new light chassis. We would have preferred if Java offered both the bikes with both front and rear disc brake, but I guess that also comes down to affordability and pricing. By pricing the bikes just above one and a half lakhs, both the Java and the 42 offer a lot of potential. Now Java plans to deliver these bikes early next year, and we can't wait to find out how the end product looks like. Now here's the second part of our best of 2018 panel discussion, where we sit down with senior industry leaders to talk shop. In this part of the AutoX Best of 2018 panel discussion, we're sitting down with Mr. Zahuruddin Khan, uh, Head AMG and Dream Car Sales at Mercedes-Benz, and Mr. Anirudh Haldar, Vice President Marketing at TVS. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Um, now, while AMG machines and 125cc scooters are at two completely different ends of the automotive uh, spectrum, my assumption is that both have one thing in common, and that's the young, up-and-coming Indian uh, consumer. Is that how you would characterize your customer base? I think so, yeah. Um, and what connects us more is, is the passion uh, for the bikes and for the AMGs. So it's passion which connects both. So. so AMG, of course, has been part of many walls of many young people growing up. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, now with uh, the end talk you have managed to get something that is featuring on a lot of people's today's walls which is the instagram and the snapchat walls yeah. so you're happy to start featuring in their social lives and 
that is coming from a very useful PG which is getting more expressive and wanting something which is really designed for them. Yeah. So I think true, it's the passion at the consumer level is really con- connecting all of us. You mentioned social media. Uh, one of the big uh, uh, points with the Entop is the connectivity features that you put into a scooter for the first time. Um, how is that resonating with uh, with your customer base? Now that's the first scooter which has got uh, Bluetooth connectivity, allowing you map access, allowing you caller ID, and that's what we now see integrated into the social media walls of lap times and uh, item details. So it's the kind of discovering that there is joy of sharing which is very much the part of joy of riding. Uh, seeing how successful it's been in the Intoke, is that something that you're planning to roll out with uh, the rest of your range? So Smart Connect as a, as a platform is a branded technology platform from TVS. Uh, while it was first debuted on the Intoke, as and when we find vehicles and target audiences which will respond to that requirement, we will take Smart Connect across. So it is something that we, is brand agnostic and will work across the TV's portfolio, yes. Um, at your end of the spectrum, are you finding that your customer base is getting younger and younger? Because I mean, these are expensive machines. Uh, so you would assume that people would uh, aspire for them once they've reached a certain stage in their life. But uh, are you finding that the customer base is getting younger? Absolutely. Uh, earlier the age was about uh, 38 years. Now the age is coming down to almost 30 years. Uh, while we're talking about age, uh, the Entoc is very specifically targeted towards Gen Z as you as you position it. But as I was mentioning to you earlier, we see a lot of people and a lot of interest from uh, age groups across the spectrum. So is it a case of uh, connectivity and bold design appealing to people regardless of age group? Uh, so you target a particular age group, but actually you encompass a, a, a lot more people. I think I'm going to... Uh go back and say that when you get the why right, um, you believe that the largest population of the why of the product comes from the Gen Z, which is about it being smart, it being maneuverable, acceleration, the kind of racing pedigree. The largest proportion of that why proportion sits in the young VC. But that why has appeal across ages. But if you get the why right, then you'll find people who believe in you coming from across different ages. We say we design it for them because that's the why we went after and that's the consumer we went after. But wherever that why resonates, it, it follows pace there. So I think it's true to say that we have designed it for the young Gen Z, but whoever feels that way, thinks that way. And it's a mindset more than a demographic. We'll find a following. In, so. so at a global level, how important is the Indian market for AMG or at a Faltabag, for instance? At what point will they start looking at the Indian market and saying that, okay, we need to make uh, XYZ vehicle because it's more attuned to, uh, say, Indian driving conditions or roads, I mean, whatever variable that, that would be. So we are doing good in a, India in terms of AMG as a business. Uh, and India is a, is a very uh, strategic market even for uh, AMG at Apaltabad. Our customers are globally traveled. And our infrastructure is still is not matching to the European standards or for other developed countries, but it's still developing as of now. All the global products that we launch in India are ensure that you no, know, it meets the uh, normal road conditions of Indian, uh, and then uh, we scale up. So without doing much on the R and D aspect, we are able to bring the cars, which is AMG per se, which these customers would have witnessed in Europe or even Dubai for that matter, in the same condition in India, and that is what they like about it. Uh, we've seen across the board that uh, bold designs seem to be the norm uh, in the industry at the moment. Um, so is it a case again of, of people wanting to uh, be more individualistic with their uh, machines? I mean, earlier the priorities in the Indian market were very different for a commuter specific, especially. Uh, is that priority changing now? So in terms of the scooters industry, if you look at it, uh, I wouldn't say all the designs are bold, but there are definitely many more distinct choices. Mm. So you have something which is a much more practical, there's something which is more retro chic, something which is more compact, or something which is more uh, performance oriented like the Entoc. Yeah. But there, there are many more distinct style choices that are today available to you, as opposed to what possibly was true uh, a few years back. And that, I think, is maturing of the industry, maturing of the consumer, where what used to be smaller needs are now becoming significant and significant enough that they deserve 
a distinct solution mm. from the manufacturers and i think that's the function that we are now seeing where smaller segments are becoming significant and the choice is multiplying are very distinct and not all of them necessarily are bold yeah. but they're definitely distinct well, thank you very much gentlemen for your insights and wish you all the best for the rest of the year and for 2019 now nissan has an aggressive suv strategy for india and it starts with this the kicks Two thousand and eighteen has been an unusually quiet year for mid-size SUVs and crossovers here in India, and that's uncanny considering that SUVs are currently riding a raging demand curve. But with the calendar leaf turning to the final month of the year, Nissan has come out all guns blazing with this. It's all new kicks for India, and I say all new with good reason. For this kicks is very different from its international counterpart. For this is built on a different platform and it's larger than the international spec Nissan kicks. Now what this means inherently is that this kicks for India is going to take on the likes of the Hyundai Creta and that could be a problem for the Hyundai Creta is the only mid-size segment car in the top 10 of our sales charts. So does this Nissan have what it takes to challenge the best in the business? Well, let's see. So one look at the kicks tells you that this car has a very edgy design language. There's creases and sharp cuts happening all over the place. All of it gives it a very sporty stance, and its high up ride height means that this car really sits well on the road. So when it comes to the interiors of the Kicks, Nissan has tried to make this place feel a little special. Uh, you get this leather stitched finish on the center console. You get a floating 8-inch touchscreen system. Uh, you have very minimalistic controls for your H-back unit. Uh, now, while that is all the good stuff, what happens here is that uh, there's a lot of hard plastics. Uh, the leather wrap itself is quite hard. So while Nissan has gone to great lengths to make this cabin feel more modern and premium, some of these elements uh, are just not up to date right now. But the real highlight of this cabin for me happened to be the front seats. They're extremely supportive. Uh, you know, cushioning in the lower back. Uh, the lumbar support, the side bolsters, everything is just right. You know, you can go on driving for hours and hours, and these seats are so good that you won't feel uncomfortable at all. So when it comes to the back seat, uh, again, this seat is phenomenally comfortable. The backrest is so good; it just has the right cushioning in the right places. Uh, the seat base isn't too bad either. I just wish I had more under thigh support here. The uncomfortable part here comes uh, when it comes to the leg room of this car. It's just a little short. With taller drivers in place, you don't have enough leg room. Space constraints are evident in the boot as well, but that's just with its on-paper figure of 400 liters capacity. In reality, the Kicks has a very usable boot thanks to its deep recess. So, like every car, the Kicks has its pros and cons. But it's now time to get into the driver's seat and see what it's like to drive. So now that I'm behind the wheel of the Kicks, uh, I have to say that uh, it feels fairly familiar, and that's because this car uses the same 1.5-liter DCI turbo diesel engine that also does duty in the Nissan Terrano and Renault Duster. So this engine, in this specification, develops 108 bhp and 240 newton meters of peak torque. And the engine is mated to a six-speed manual transmission, and when it comes to drivability. Uh, when you feed in linear throttle inputs, acceleration is very gradual. The gear shifts are light, although the throws are a little long, and the clutch is a little springy, though. Now, when it comes to a gearbox, the first and second gears have short ratios. What this means is that you need to have frequent gear changes in slow-moving traffic and stop-start traffic conditions. But from there on, third gear, fourth gear, fifth, and sixth are well spaced, and you can drive effortlessly. This engine starts to deliver at around 1,700 odd RPM. That's when peak torque kicks in at 1,750 RPM. Uh, from there on, there's a decent amount of punch, but it's when you want to make those quick overtaking maneuvers. Uh, despite you know a downshift, it will still take you some effort to overtake. So from 2,000 RPM onwards is when the power comes in nice and strong, 
and uh, it stays with you as this engine revs to 4000 rpm post which uh, you tend to feel that the engine's getting a little bit sluggish so you need to keep this engine between 2000 and 4000 rpm to extract the best performance out of it now nissan emphasizes that they have set this car up for a more spirited driving audience to that reason the suspension setup i can feel is a little bit on the stiffer side i have to say that the car remains fairly confident around bends Nissan insists that this car has minimal body roll, which again will be down to a stiffer suspension setup. The downside to that is uh, that over broken tarmac right could get a little bumpy. Having said that, I haven't really driven this car over poor roads, so I can't really comment on that right now. But what I can say is that uh, like the Tirano and the Duster, the steering wheel again has a fair amount of kickback out on the road, especially over abrupt surfaces. The driving position of the kicks is fairly good. You get a good view of the road all around. The driving seat position, even in its lowest setting, is high enough so you get a good commanding view of the road. Uh, it's these A pillars, though, they're long and they, while they look nice on the design front, uh, they can pose a bit of a blind spot uh, during you know, fast right bends or even in uh, slower moving traffic. Another quirk here is this center armrest now it's not movable in any way and it comes in the way you know when you're shifting gears so having driven around in the kicks for a bit uh, I have noticed uh, that it's a decently well put together package you got good styling going for you you have a decent equipment list so while the kicks has a lot of stuff going for it like every car it has its shortcomings too so with that in mind we have to wait until Nissan puts down its final playing card on the table come January 2019 when it launches the kicks in India. So crucially, it's the pricing of this car that will be the key to the success of the kicks in India. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. Thank you for joining us, but make sure you catch us next weekend on the AutoX show, because we have a really special year-end show with a pair of super fast Porsches to get your pulse racing. Now remember, it's chaos out there, so make sure you buckle up and always wear your helmets. We'll see you again next weekend on the AutoX Show.